And uh, I think I explained to you why uh, uh, the issue of the, the whole issue of the abnormal, because one morning a prophet appeared to me in a dream, and that prophet said that it was mentioned the abnormal year of 2019. You know, and that is why uh, when you hear me talk about the abnormal, because that's not a word I would have thought of, but when you hear me talk about the abnormal, that is, uh, that is the foundation of that word abnormal. Um, somebody came to see me, I think, about one or two weeks ago. They've been going through a bit of a situation with their family, and uh, there was, uh, I will not give you the full testimony, but when the time is ripe, the person themselves will come and share. But she said that one of her uncles said that uh, this is abnormal, but they moved away from what was conventionally done and they did something that was and was not expected what was unusual am i making sense i'm not giving you the full context because i give you the full context some of you are very sharp and you'll be able to know the full context but for me what blessed me was the uncle used the word this is abnormal it was not it is not conventional and when you hear the testimony you'll understand it is not conventional it is abnormal but it was a, for me it was an encouragement that look this season of the abnormal is not just a word out there in the air where abnormal things are beginning to take place are we together unusual things unheard of things i know that that word abnormal many times is used for the negative and this year by the way is a season for abnormal negative and abnormal positive now the choice is yours. Am I making sense? The choice is yours based on your confession, based on your faith, based on what you believe, uh, based on what you feed yourself. The choice is yours. But this is a season of the abnormal. And I think when we began in January, we began with, uh, with bomb blasts all over the place. Again, something that had disappeared for a number of years and it seemed to be coming back. Ab abnormal, unusual things are happening this year. So we've been talking about the seven spirits of God. And I want to pick up from there. And today, we want to just focus on the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And... Uh, the last time I was here, I asked the question, are these seven spirits angels? Because when we discuss the seven spirits, um, uh, some of us believe that the seven spirits are angels. And uh, somebody actually asked me that question, and at that time I didn't have an answer. So I said, I don't believe they are angels. I believe that these are separate beings. Am I making sense? These are separate beings, and each very distinct from angels. When we begin to operate in the spiritual realm, um, God will begin to un unveil to us or reveal to us um, dimensions that we've not thought existed before. Sometimes, by the way, we limit God to what we have seen. Sometimes we limit um, the appearance of God to what we have seen. But when our eyes begin to open to a spiritual realm, we'll begin to see aspects and dynamics and dimensions that we have not seen before. So these are not angels. They are different beings. In a sense, in a sense, all of us are angels. Am I making sense? Because all of us are messengers. So in that sense, you could call them angels. But in the strictest sense, in a stricter sense, they are not angels. Genesis chapter 16 verse 9, he says that the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I'll multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. But in Isaiah chapter 61, he says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So you see in, in Genesis chapter 16, he says, the angel of the Lord, but in Isaiah chapter 61, he says the spirit of the Lord. They are, dif they are distinct beings. Are we together? They are separate beings. And then in Deuteronomy 34 verse 9, for me this was the clincher, he says that Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom for Moses had laid his hands on him. So he was filled with the spirit of wisdom. Angels don't fill you. Angels operate from the outside. But because these are spirits from, from heaven, they can fill us. They can occupy us. And he was full of the spirit of wisdom because God had laid his hands upon him. Or rather, because Moses had laid his hands upon him. What I find very interesting in that scripture, you know, many times if I was asked, what mantle did Joshua operate under? I would say that Joshua operated under the spirit of might. But notice what the Bible says. Because Joshua was a warrior. Am I not right? When you talk about um, um, David, the Bible says David was a mighty warrior. That word mighty is the same thing as the spirit of might. But in this case, the Bible says that Joshua was filled with the spirit of wisdom. Which means that even when he came to taking territory, it was important that you have wisdom. Am I making sense? The issue sometimes was not just about taking territory, but was also to be able to divide the territory according to, the, according to each community, according to each class and according to each individual. So it says that Joshua was filled with the spirit of wisdom for Moses had laid his hands upon him and that scripture seems to say also that Moses himself was filled with the spirit of wisdom. So that mantle, as he laid hands on Joshua, that mantle had transferred from Moses to Joshua. Uh, one of the things that we will see when we begin to talk about the spirit of wisdom is that the spirit of wisdom covers blueprints. When you talk about wisdom, you're talking about blueprints. Am I making sense? You're talking about blueprints for building. 
Are we together? So when the spirit of wisdom comes, the spirit of wisdom comes to give you blueprints to achieve the purposes of God for your life. Blueprints for business. Blueprints for ministry. Blueprints for marriage. Blueprints for family. Are we together? Because the spirit of wisdom has to do with giving you an overall blueprint of the purposes of God in the particular area that God has called you to. And that begins to tell us that when you begin to operate by the spirit of wisdom, we are going to begin to increasingly build according to the scroll or the blueprint that heaven has for us. I hope I'm not going too fast. We are good? All right. So these are examples of other spiritual beings, spirit beings. There's the spirit of grace. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 talks about the spirit of grace. There's a spirit of supplication. You see that in Zechariah 12 10. There's a spirit of burning. There's a spirit of judgment. There's a spirit of, ju of justice. Now we say that the difference between angels and, uh, and the, the, the seven spirits of God is that spirits fill people while angels are external to us. Angels operate from the outside but spirits operate from the inside. And because spirits operate from the inside inside when the spirit when that mantle comes upon you that mantle transforms you am i making sense angels cannot change you angels provide angels supply angels bring what you need but they cannot change you change comes from the spirit residing inside of you are we together so when the spirit of wisdom begins to reside inside of you he unlocks in you reservoirs or depths of the wisdom of god when the spirit of knowledge resides inside of you the spirit of knowledge begins to unlock inside of you depths or reservoirs of the knowledge of god hello are we together Okay, I'm, I'm just warming up, but uh, it is fine. So what are their functions? When you begin to think about their functions, what are their functions? And I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get too technical here, but the fear of the Lord, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, that is the key. That is the key that unlocks the door. I think it was on Friday or Saturday, I don't know when it was, it was yesterday also, that we had this vision, somebody had the vision of keys being downloaded. Are we together? As we are gathered here praying for businesses, keys were being downloaded. God is giving us keys in this season to unlock doors. Can somebody say amen? The fear of the Lord, that is the key that unlocks the doors. So if we are not operating in the fear of the Lord, uh, we might as well forget everything else. Am I making sense? Because that is what unlocks the doors. That's what unlocks the doors for wisdom. That's what unlocks the doors for knowledge and understanding. The fear of the Lord unlocks the door. In Isaiah chapter 11 verse 3, it says that his delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Talking about Jesus, that Jesus is delight. Jesus is joy. We'll explore that word delight, but for now, his joy, his affection, his passion was in the fear of the Lord. The question I have for you today is, is your joy, your affection, your passion in the fear of the Lord, or your joy, your affection, and your passion is in the doings of the Lord? Because many times the focus is more on the doings, the acts of God. What has God done? The miracles of God. This is what God did for me than on the Lord himself. But when you begin to focus on the fear of the Lord, it becomes all about God himself. It becomes all about God himself. And many times when we are talking about, especially the supernatural dimension, it, we, we enjoy the supernatural, but it's also important to realize that God is after us. More than the supernatural, God is after us. More than the supernatural, more than signs and wonders and miracles and legs growing and, and hair growing and people losing weight and all those things, God is after us. And that's why the fear of the Lord has to be first. It is the anchor. It is the starting point. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible also says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's the starting point. That's the key. Isaiah chapter 33, is it verse 6? It says, He will be your sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. And he says there, the fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20 says, Wisdom calls aloud outside. Can you hear the voice of wisdom? Wisdom calls aloud outside. Wisdom is calling. Wisdom is calling. Ah, She raises her voice in the open square. You're not getting excited? You don't feel the energy from this scripture? Ah, okay. She cries out in the chief concourses. But then I'll tell you something. Wisdom is calling, but folly or foolishness is also calling. Am I making sense? They're both shouting. Come here, come here. All those who are foolish, come here. And the foolish align with foolishness. Are we together? All those who, are, who need wisdom, come here. And the wise or the simple align with wisdom. Both of them are calling. 
Both of them sort of have the same, the same, is it structure, purpose, assignment as it were. You need to be careful about whose voice you're listening to. So she cries out in the chief concourses. At the openings of the gates in the city, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you have simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge. Says, stand at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. That talks about revelation. Verse 24, it says, because I have called and you have refused. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. So wisdom says, I think verse 25 or 26 says, therefore when, when, when judgment comes or the evil day comes, I will smile. And that's my paraphrase. It's not exactly like that. But when the evil day comes, in fact, I love that because it tells me that um, there's an evil day coming. <laughs> How are we doing? There's an evil day coming for every business. There's an evil day coming for every marriage. There's an evil day coming for every church. There's an evil day coming for every relationship. And that evil day comes to test the foundation on which you've been building. Am I making sense? That evil day, the intention of that evil day is not to destroy you, is to test the foundation on which you've been building. If you've been building on the foundation of wisdom, you're fine. Are we together? But if you've been building on the foundation of foolishness and folly, then that evil day will expose what you've been building on. Even Paul himself said that everything that we do will be tested by fire. Everything that we do will be tested by fire. So what are you building on? What is the foundation of what you're doing? What's the foundation of your relationships? Your relationships with your children. What's the foundation of your relationships? Your marriages. What's the foundation of what you're building on? Because everything that we'll do will be tested by fire. Everything will be tested by fire. So when wisdom is speaking, wisdom knows that there is going to be a day of shaking. And the purpose of that shaking is not destruction. The purpose of that shaking is to expose the foundation that you've been building on so that you may build on the right foundation. Okay, I think that would be a good place to say amen, but it's fine. We are, it's fine. I understand. I can see where you are. This is Ezekiel chapter 11. The Spirit of the Lord is focused more on the manifestation, the expression. I was listening to somebody this week and he said that the Spirit of the Lord is focused on lordship. Are we together? Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That word Lord means master. Except that in this case, the Spirit of the Lord is the Spirit of Yahweh. It says, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said to me, speak. And thus said the Lord, thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. So, when the time came for Ezekiel to begin to act or to begin to walk into fullness of his ministry, the Spirit of the Lord sort of came to confirm and mandate him. Are we together? The Spirit of the Lord is a spirit of dominion that gives you dominion in your sphere of authority. Every one of us has a mountain. Every one of us has a sphere of authority. And when the Spirit of the Lord comes, the Spirit of the Lord comes to give us dominion in our sphere of authority. So because Ezekiel was called to be a prophet, God began, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him to give him dominion in that area to stand as a ruler to stand as a master to stand as a lord in that area jesus himself uh, says that the spirit of the lord is upon me because he has anointed me and he talks about his assignment he was waiting for that place in the early years of jesus the bible says jesus grew in wisdom but he came to a place where it was no longer talking about wisdom. He began talking about the spirit of the Lord is upon me because gears have shifted. I've shifted from my training season to my manifestation season. And when I enter my manifestation season, I receive an anointing from on high that allows me to become a master or a lord over my sphere of authority. Am I making sense? So you can see the key now becomes the fear of the Lord. The trainer now becomes wisdom. Because when you begin to talk about wisdom, we'll discover that wisdom is a package. Wisdom comes with knowledge. Wisdom comes with counsel. Wisdom comes with understanding. Are we together? Wisdom comes with might. Wisdom says, I dwell with might. She does not dwell alone. I dwell with might. It's almost like these guys have, uh, can I use this word? These guys have built houses and those houses around each other. The Bible says wisdom has built her house. So wisdom has a house. And they, it's like these guys are dwelling together. They have the best of pals and the best of buddies. How, how are we doing? You know, I, I don't know. This is the picture that comes into my heart. You know, when I think, think of the spirit of wisdom, I know the spirit of wisdom is a she. So this is a picture that comes into my heart. I think of a tall lady with uh, wearing longs. You know, long... I'm just... This is the picture that comes. Are we together? Uh, uh, I'm trying to describe those, you know, those long, those long trousers that sort of are loose, very loose fitting, very elegantly dressed, you know. 
Maruti, 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 this two, this two, this two, this two. Th th that's the picture that comes into my heart. Maybe the picture that comes into your heart is somebody wearing jeans. Maybe it's jeans. Are we together? But that's the picture. And v dressed in a very stately fashion. Stately. S-T-A-T-E-L-Y. That's English. It's, it's English. Yes, yes, yes. You're, you know, there's a, there's a bench here that is betting my English. This bench is telling me that is English, that is not English. That is... <laughs> That is mother tongue. Okay. So we've dressed in a very stately fashion. That's the picture I have. Every time I think of the spirit of wisdom, that's the picture I have. Very elegant. Very elegant. A very elegant person. That's the spirit of wisdom. So, Isaiah chapter 11 verse 3. It says, His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. That word delight talks about a refreshing wind. It actually comes from the word ruach. And that word ruach is the same word that is used, or the same root word that is used when you talk about the spirit, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of might. It says, His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. It's like the delight in the Lord was like a refreshing wind. That's what used to refresh him. When you look at the root word of that word, uh, ruach, he say, he, the root word talks about, this is, you know, the Hebrews, the way the Hebrews used to define words, when the Greeks were defining words, the Greeks you had abstract words. I'll give you an example. You know, the word glory. Every time I used to think of glory, I used to think of a cloud. When you think of glory, what do you think about? A cloud. You see, that's a Greek concept. It's, you can't touch it. But the Hebrew concept of glory was something touch, touchable. So they would actually define glory as, as, as one, as weight, something heavy. And they would define glory as wealth. So when they talk about the glory of God, they talk about the wealth of God. Am I making sense? They would always have something concrete, not something abstract. It's the Greeks who brought the abstract sense, but the, 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 the Hebrews had something tangible, something you could identify with. So when the Hebrews, for example, talk about ruach, the breath, or the refreshing wind, the concept was that the Hebrew nomads in those days were familiar with wind patterns. You know, the winds would blow in the desert, and they would be able to follow the wind patterns, and the patterns of the wind would tell them what season was, coming. Am I making sense? So they were so aware that when this wind began to blow, some of us know that when a certain wind begins to blow, that wind is bringing rain. That when this wind begins to blow, you know exactly what is coming. The Jews understood that. And when the Bible talks about delighting in the fear of the Lord, it's talking about that kind of wind. That when she delights in the fear of the Lord, that delight, that wind, that refreshment that comes from the fear of the Lord is also an indication of what is coming after. It is telling him that it's not just about the fear of the Lord, but the fear of the Lord is a key or a foundation or a stepping stone to that which is coming next. But his delight, that delight in the fear of the Lord, he was refreshed by the fear of the Lord. Am I making sense? That was his joy. That's what brought him passion. That was the key that unlocks the door. You know, many times we can focus on the doings of the Lord and not on the fear of the Lord. But when it comes to operating the seven spirits of the Lord, we need to understand that one, all of them are working interconnected. Am I making sense? And number two, that if the foundation is not right, then that whole building will be distorted. So the foundation must be right. And the foundation must be the fear of the Lord. That's the foundation. Must be the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord talks about the awe, the wonder, the majesty of God. You know, how do you respond when God comes? How do you respond when God comes? As, as, as we are worshipping today, um, um, you know, that's what I've been asking myself. How do I respond when God comes? As we were worshiping today, there's a certain place we got to when I felt like a cloud. I'm not sure whether I'm the only one who felt like there was a cloud, but I felt like there's a cloud. And I felt like we need to camp there. You know, we just need to stay there. Don't run. Don't rush anywhere. Just stay there. And when that cloud, I felt that presence, I began to ask myself, how do I respond in the presence of God? And how I respond is, I kneel. If Jesus came here, how would you respond? Hey, Jesus, give me a high five. Hallelujah, you're my big brother. You know, the, the way we respond tells us a lot about the awe, the respect, the honor that we have for him. Now, Jesus does not come to strike us with fear, but there's a certain reverence that we need for him. Am I making sense? And uh, there's a rebuke we received sometime this week uh, because somebody said as we were worshiping, Jesus walked in and none of us seemed to recognize that he was there. Sometimes he walks in and we are casual in terms of our response to him. And what we are saying here is that if you're walking in the fear of the Lord, the awe, the wonder, the majesty, you will respond. You cannot remain the same. You will respond. You will do something. 
You will respond in one way or another. And the way you respond is a reflection of the honor and the respect that we have for him. I think it's Malachi either chapter 1 or chapter 2 where the father asks, he says, if I am a father, where is my honor? There's a certain honor that is due to God. Am I making sense? And the fear of the Lord has to do with the honor that is due to him. Out of that honor and respect that is due to him, everything else flows. If that honor and respect that is due to him is misaligned, misappropriated, or not built properly, then everything else is in The whole building crumbles. The strength of the building is determined by the foundation. If the foundation is not right, then no matter what you try to put on top of that building, it will crumble because the foundation can't carry it. But if the foundation is right, even if we build wrongly on top, we still can come back to a foundation and rebuild again correctly. So it has to do with being in awe of God. It has to do with majesty. It has to do with respect. It has to do with how I, I honor God. How my life honors him. When, when he shows up, how do I respond? Am I casual about him? Am I casual about his words? Am I casual about the things that he says? That word... Uh, that word fear is the word yirat, Yahweh. And yirat means flowing from the gut. I found this very interesting. You know, because the Bible says that out of your belly shall do what? Shall flow rivers of living water. So it's that which comes out of the gut of Yahweh. That which comes out of the belly of Yahweh. The message here, one of the messages here is that the fear of the Lord cannot come from us. You see, for a long time I used to think that the fear of the Lord comes from me. But I'm beginning to realize the fear of the Lord does not come from me. The fear of the Lord comes from Him. He gives us that respect for Him. He gives us, He fills us with that honor for Him. He fills us with that awe for Him. He fills us with a part of Himself that every time we come into His presence, I stand in awe of you. I'm so awed by his goodness. I'm so awed by his favor. I'm so awed by his mercy. I'm so awed by his beauty. Am I making sense? There was a time when, when I used to reflect on that scripture, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And I would think, God, your holiness is beautiful. Holiness does not look beautiful. It looks like a ritual. But you see, as you grow in the fear of the Lord, then you begin to understand the beauty of holiness. You begin to understand what true worship is all about. The depth of our worship, by the way, is based on the depth of our fear. If there's no fear of God in our eyes, then even our worship is very shallow. Right. Am I making sense? We can sing, we can sing anointed songs, but our worship is shallow. We need to move beyond anointed, not anointed, I don't even think the word is anointed, but good music, good sounds, to anointed sounds, that every time we sing those songs and people come into that presence, that presence is yoke destroying, burden removing, captivity turning around. Am I making sense? That every time we come into our presence, God is able to identify the needs of the people and meet the needs of the people. That's the difference. And not good music or good sounds or a good song, you'll come in, you'll enjoy, you'll feel the goosebumps for a moment, you live the same way you came in. But when you talk about anointed music, because the foundation of that is there's a reverential fear of God. When you talk about that kind of worship, then it breaks things. We come into the atmosphere of God and all of a sudden we came in sick, we are healed. We came in wounded, uh, there's a balm, a healing balm that is poured out on those wounds. We came in depressed and oppressed and all of a sudden we feel like those dep that depression and oppression is lifted off our shoulders. The fear of the Lord comes from him. Look at these words. The word of Yahweh. Because the fear of the Lord is the fear of Yahweh. The word of Yahweh, that's the word of the Lord. It comes from Yahweh. The voice of Yahweh, that's the voice of the Lord. It comes from Yahweh. The face of Yahweh, that's the face of the Lord. It comes from him. It's not your face. It is his face. The face of the name of Yahweh. That is the name of the Lord. It comes from all of these things come from him. So why should we think that the fear of the Lord is any different? The fear of the Lord comes from him. And we need to ask God, God, fill my heart with the fear of you. I need a holy reverential fear of you. I know that the season that we're entering into demands that. If the foundation we're building on is not the holy reverential fear of God, that foundation will be shaken. That foundation will be shaken. There are days coming where people are going to begin to die in the church. I've received that word. And I've been told that in this church, the day is coming. If people don't watch out, they're going to begin to die in church. I'm not the one killing you. I'm not planning to kill you. Are we together? I'm not planning to kill anybody. Are we, am I making sense? But God himself, 
will begin to deal. There comes a time when God himself begins to build his church. It is his church. It's not my church. It is his church. There comes a time when God begins to take charge to do what he needs to do. He establishes what he needs to establish. And if we don't begin to operate in the fear of the Lord, we might find, we might be found one thing. There was a prophetic word that um, 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 Prophet Sadu gave out in October last year. And he, he warned, that word went all over Africa. And he warned, he sent a warning. He said that if the church in Africa does not get its act sorted out by December last year, he says there's a wave coming. God is going to begin to take some people home. Do you know that since the beginning of the year, some of my friends have been telling me that God is taking people home in the church, in church leadership. Why? Some of them have finished their race. But some of them, I believe God is removing them from the scene because God understands that as long as they are there, the church will never walk in the fear of God. There's a godly fear that God expects of us in this season. And God expects us to desire that fear because that fear is what unlocks the door. If our hearts are still casual concerning him and concerning the things of him, we'll never be able to walk in the fullness of his agenda. Some of the things that God wants to do in this season are amazing, astounding. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, it has not entered the hearts of men. But we will not walk in those things if we don't have the fear of him. We will not experience those things if we don't have the fear of him. There's a certain awe, there's certain respect, there's certain majesty he expects. There's certain response that he expects when he comes in. Um, let me throw this here and then maybe I can run. You know God's throne, the Bible says when Ezekiel saw the throne of God, he saw the throne of God with wheels. Why does the throne of God have wheels? Because it moves. Isn't that obvious? Yes. Hello? Anything that has wheels can move. That means that throne is a mobile throne. So God decides, it's like this guy, I don't know whether, whether this guy is of uh, the mobile court for what? For, uh, for traffic. Is it traffic offenses? So the court would keep moving from place to place. Hallelujah. Woe unto you if you found the mobile court sitting just <laughs> to any child. <laughs> our chai people know themselves. Where are our chai people? Our chai people know themselves. Our chai people. Wana jijua. Wana jijua. God's, God's throne is mobile. So what happens when the throne of God appears in Hekima? What happens when the throne of God appears in Hekima? How do we respond? The way we respond is a reflection of the awe and the majesty and the fear of the Lord that we have. If for us it's just a good song, it's just a good sound, and nothing in us changes, Nothing, you know, the Bible says, um, um, this is Paul speaking, that because we know these things about God, we tremble. If we do not tremble at, that, at God coming in, we need to recheck some things. Am I making sense? We need to check under the hood. Because when God comes in, yes, when Jesus comes in, yes, he's our big brother. But there's a certain trembling and awe that we need to have of him. When the father comes in, there's a, he's our father, yes, but there's a certain trembling and awe that he expects us to have of him. If we don't have that trembling and awe, we need to check under the hood. We need to recheck. We need to recheck our belief systems about God. Something somewhere is wrong. And because that thing is wrong, you'll be found out. You'll be found out. God is the architect of the house. So God knows exactly what he's building. And he knows exactly what he's interested in. And he also knows that when the shaking comes, he knows exactly what will stand the, what will stand the shaking and what will not stand the shaking. The fear of God. This is uh, Exodus chapter 10, I believe it is. Verse 10. Exodus chapter 19, verse 10. He says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. And let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for all the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you not go up to that mountain or touch its base. Whatever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast. He shall not live when the trumpet sounds long. They shall come near the mountain. Now this is Exodus chapter 20, the very next chapter. He says, Now all the people 
witness the thunderings. They witness the lightning. They witness the flashes. They witness the sound of the trumpet. They witness the mountain smoking. I mean, this is God coming. Are we together? This is, you know the way when Uhuru is appearing on the scene? Woo, 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 woo. Then you see the outriders. After the outriders, you see the Mercedes Benz. Now, these are the outriders. Are we together? Thunder. That's the outrider. God himself has not appeared. He's coming. He's still on the way. Are we together? But the first guy who appears on the scene is thunder. Then he says lightning. Can you begin to imagine what it was like on that mountain? Can you just begin to imagine what it was like on that mountain? Thunder, lightning flashes, the sound of a trumpet. Doo -doo 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 -doo. This is God coming. Are we together? This is, so one of these fine days of year, some of us making sound like a trumpet, just know that we have a precedence from scripture. This is God coming. God is not coming quietly. You know, some of us think that God is a quiet God. God just likes quiet time. Hallelujah. Ah. <laughs> well, thunder and lightning and flashes and boo. And some of you who have a problem with high sounds, I think when Jesus comes or God comes, we're going to have a problem with that. He says they trembled. They trembled. There was a certain fear when they saw this thing. This thing broke convention. Can you imagine a mountain smoking? Have you ever seen a mountain smoking? I'm not talking about a hill smoking. A mountain smoking. The mountain was full of smoke. This guy came in a dark cloud. He says they trembled and they stood afar off. That's the God that we serve. He said, then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear you. But let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear. For God has come to test you that his fear may be with you. That his fear may be with you. The reason why God appeared in that way was because he wanted a certain fear and awe of himself to be in the people. But I'm trying to communicate something here. The people over responded to what God wanted. You see, God wanted to have a personal relationship with him that was characterized by the fear of God. <laughs> when God appeared like this, the people said, Moses, you speak to God and let God speak to us. It was not supposed to be like that from the beginning. Every one of them was supposed to hear from God themselves. Everyone was supposed to, it was not a certain anointed lot who are called prophets, that the prophets are the ones who hear from God. The rest of us now follow the prophets blindly. Every one of us was supposed to hear from God themselves. But what ended up happening was there was so much human fear began to replace the fear of God. And when that human fear came in, that human fear told them, Moses, talk to God. We don't want to talk to this guy. This guy can wipe us out at any moment. You don't want to talk to him. And they missed the mark completely. The mark God is aiming at is the fear of God. You know, for the last two or three weeks, we've been talking in the midweek and we're uh, sort of trying to prepare our hearts for visitation. Um, and not just for visitation, but also for habitation. God wants to inhabit um, his people. But one of the things I said is that one of the things God needs to deal with us is the fear of him. That fear that is rooted in human fear. Am I making sense? Because sometimes when God visits, God does not come conventionally. And that's why many times when God has appeared, the first thing that God says is, fear not. Because you imagine, 2 o'clock at night, you begin to hear poop, 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 poop in your kitchen. And, the, and, the, and the, this is 2 o'clock at night. You're waking up to pray. Have quiet time. You tell me what you'll do. Poop, poop from the kitchen door. You hear the kitchen door opening. It closes. Poop, poop, poop. You hear the other door. This is 2 o'clock at night. First of all, you ask, am I hearing correctly or am I hearing wrongly? You clear out your ear. The footsteps are getting louder. Poop, 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 poop. And you're in the sitting room praying. Praying. Poop, poop, poop. And then it stops behind you. You tell me. <laughs> you, te you tell me you'll be fine. You tell me you'll be fine. Are we together? Tell me you'll be fine. Tell me you wake up the following morning. Hallelujah, Jesus visited me. You know, tell me you'll be fine. That's why these guys, they fell down like dead. Am I making sense? <laughs> I mean, they were terrified. When he appeared, they were terrified. Now, this is maybe an angel coming. The day Jesus comes like a fully grown lion. Are we together? You step downstairs. A lion walks in. <laughs> tell me you'll be okay. Am I making Tell me you'll be okay. Tell me you'll be okay. Because when God began to manifest, these guys were terrified. The Bible says Ezekiel sat quiet for seven days. He couldn't speak. Seven days. 
Some of you need to have those visitations. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm sure your husbands will begin to pray. I'm not looking at any husband here. I'm sure some husbands are going to begin to pray, God, let my wife have that visitation so she can be quiet for seven days. Hallelujah. You know, seven days. What kind of visitation was that? That you're in such... <laughs> We're not naming any husbands. Have we named any husbands? Have we named any husbands? We're not named. We're not... We're... That's a prayer point for men's prayer breakfast. Hallelujah. Okay. But I'm just trying to communicate something. Can you imagine that he kept quiet for seven days? What happened? What kind of encounter was that? One of the guys I was reading said he one day walked into the presence of God and he said he looked at the eyes of God. You know, and he, as he saw the eyes of God, he, he saw into eternity. Can, you can imagine the eyes of God. Eh? You know, they say that the eyes of a person are the soul of a person. So you, you can imagine somebody who is ageless. Endless. Am I making sense? The, 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 he has no beginning. He has, so you can imagine, you can, you can fall into those eyes and fall for eternity. And then he said the most amazing thing happened. He says as he looked into his eyes, the most amazing things happened. The guy's face began to change. He face changed from a face of a man to the face of an eagle, to the face of an ox, to the face of a lion. To the face of a man, the face of an eagle, the face of an ox, you tell me. I'm asking you a question. You're having a visitation. You're looking to the eyes of God. Oh God, I love you. <laughs> then all of a sudden, <laughs> the face changes to the face of a lion. Where? <laughs> yes, yes. But that, what? It's in the Bible. They talk about the four faces of God. Yes, it's, I'm not talking about something that's not biblical. It's in the Bible. His face. This guy says his face literally began to change. I was one. I was so just. I'm thinking, wow. I'm also thinking, hey, God, you need to work on my heart. Am I making sense? You need to work on me and prepare me for that kind of thing. But look, at God wants us to walk in the fear of him. Never to get to a place where we can be casual with him. That's the point. Never get to a place where you can be casual with him. Because when we are casual with God, we miss out on the blessing of God. And so when God appears in this manner, when God appears with the thunder, with the lightnings, with all these things, part of the reason why God is manifesting like that is because there's a, an awe, a holy reverence that he wants from you. Am I making sense? We need to come to a place where some things don't affect us anymore. These things are too small. When we've stood in the presence of God, some things are too small. Am I making sense? That somebody cutting you off in traffic is too small eh, when you've stood in the presence of God. The reason it's a big thing is because you've not stood there. But when you stand there and you know that at any point in time, anything can happen. Anything can happen. Some things begin to lose significance and value. There's a certain fear of God that needs to come back to a church. A certain awe, a certain reverence of God that needs to come back to a church. Where we stop being casual about some things. We stop being casual about some things. There's a prophecy that was given last year by a prophet by the name of Paul Cain. Uh, Paul Cain died uh, this year, I think in uh, last month, last month or last month but one. But this prophecy, I'm waiting for my people, but they don't seem to be moving. Uh, this is the word of the Lord that was given on February 2nd, 2018. He says, you're going to see some things that will leave some of you without words for days. You see that, that visitation that Ezekiel had, those visitations are coming back. It will leave you without words for days. He says, there's a resurgence of the fear of the Lord coming and it will fall suddenly it will fall unexpectedly. It will fall unannounced. I want to tell you something. God is not asking you for permission. God is not asking you for permission. He's not waiting for you to get your house sorted out. Am I making sense? We are in the days of suddenly. This thing is going to happen suddenly. Because God has a quick work to do, this thing is going to happen suddenly. He says a new day is coming. It is not an encore. An encore meaning a repeat. It's not a repeat of the old. This is completely new. Eye has not seen this thing. Ear has not heard this thing. It has not yet entered the hearts of men. Something completely new. He says there, this will be like no other. Where we are going to, there is no precedence. There is no precedence. God himself, that's why our identity, God himself needs to define us. We cannot define ourselves by the men of God in the times past. God is bringing us to a place where he himself is the one who names us. The Bible says that the 11 children were named by their mothers, but there was a son. And that man's son was called who? Benjamin. He was named by the father. 
All the other 11 children are named by the mother, but there was one son who was named by the father. All these other moves that we have enjoyed have been named in a sense by the church. But there's a generation that is rising and there's a move that is coming that God himself shall be the one that baptized that move and called that move. There's a generation that God is calling unto himself that they will represent him before men. And he will identify them and anoint them and empower them and prepare them himself. There's a generation, the Bible says, their children shall be taught of the Lord. Shall not be taught of men. Shall be taught of the Lord. That is the generation that God is raising in this season. And when God is saying that, be rooted in the fear of me, is because that is the key that unlocks that door. If that generation is going to arise, that generation needs to have a certain reverence and a certain fear of God. I had a prophecy by, okay, let me finish this one. It says it's not an encore. It says this will be a hallmark of a huge wave of the spirit that will sweep around the earth. It says it will be about holiness and purity of heart. It is a waste of time telling folks to get ready. Trying to tell you to get ready is a waste of time. This prophecy was given one year ago. This guy, Paul Cain, is one of the most accurate prophets. In, in his generation. Paul Cain, what I, I heard this story from Mama Dorothy. Mama Dorothy said that um, um, the past of blood tidings assembly in Buruburu, the bishop, I think some of you were there in Buruburu. Okay, he was a bishop. I've forgotten his name again, but he passed on some time ago. Walks into a room. This is in the UK. Walks into a room. Paul Cain is the one preaching. Paul Cain stops him. Say, you there. You're from Kenya. He's walking into a room. Stops him at the door, says, you're from Kenya. This is what God is telling me, that this is in the 90s. That there's a revival coming, and you're supposed to spear that revival. And when you go back, God wants to use you as a vessel for that revival. Walks into a room. How does this guy know that this guy's from Kenya? This guy's on the pulpit and talks to him. And, and, and Mama D says that when he came back, God began moving in their midst. Doing things that were unusual, unconventional, until men stopped that revival. Because people began asking questions, saying, hey, this thing that you're doing is not normal. You see, we want to fit into a normal. This thing that you're doing is not normal. This thing that, because we want to be conventional, we want to be like everybody else. And because we want to be like everybody else, and I think uh, the leadership got a bit concerned that, hey, maybe what we're doing, we've gone overboard. Let's bring things back to normal. And they missed the move of God just because they wanted it to be normal. Yeah, some of us are from Glide Tidings, Buruburu. You, you can get the testimony from them. I think Oscar was there. You can get the testimony. I don't know who else was there. But you can get the testimony from them. How at one time, that was the place where things were happening. But because we, 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 we wanted to be like everybody else. We want to be conventional. We do not want to stand out. We do not want to be different. And you see, when God begins to move, you have no choice. You have no option. God is calling you to be different. Not normal. He's calling you to be different. And if you don't accept that call and stand up to that call, then this is Paul Cain. I mean, he has amazing testimonies. He's a mentor of people like Rick Joyner. He has amazing testimonies. He says it'll ca just come suddenly. A revival with a hallmark of tears, but also profound intimacy with the person of the Holy Ghost. That's what is coming. That is what is coming. And we have a choice to either resist and allow God to pass over us, or agree. And when we agree then God can make us a part of this revival. God, release the fear of you. Let there be a holy, reverential fear of you in my heart. Am I making sense? Let it not be that I come to a place where I'm casual about you, I can walk into your presence, and I don't feel anything. Am I making sense? I walk into your presence, I walk out, and my heart is not touched. Are we together? Let it be that when I walk into your presence, and I sense you moving, that God, my heart is always soft is always willing to bend. Are we together? You know, I, I don't cry easily, but I respect people who cry. I make fun of them, but I respect people who cry because I realize I know there's a place I need to get to. I know there's a place I need to get to where I walk into, and, and even men who cry, they're men who cry, they know themselves. They know themselves. Ben, are they? <laughs> they know themselves anyway. I'm just making fun. Because the reality is this. There's a place we need to get to where when God touches our heart, we are broken. Amen. God doesn't touch you. Yeah. No. No. That's not a sign of maturity. No. When God touches your heart, you're broken. Now, I'm not saying you need to fall. 
I'm not saying you need to fall. I love that word that we need to stand in the glory. But I'm saying there's a certain brokenness. Amen. There's a certain brokenness we need to have. When you feel God moving, your heart responds. I mean, that's why the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. There was some that, I mean, this guy made his own mistakes, did his own things, but there was a certain reverential fear of God. When God spoke to him and he heard the voice of God, he would respond immediately. We're not waiting for tomorrow. We're not waiting for the day after tomorrow. We don't have to send you three, four, five prophets to come and prophesy to you. One word from the Lord is enough. By the time you need five prophets to come and tell you the same thing, what does that tell you? What does that tell you about your heart? If you need five people to come and tell you what the Lord is saying, and they're all saying the same thing, different iterations, and you're still not responding, what does that tell you about your heart? It tells you there's something in you that needs to change. There's something. The problem is not out there. The problem is in here. And that is where we need to work. That's where God wants to work. God wants to change our hearts. God doesn't want us to miss out on what he's doing in this season. Am I making sense? God wants to change our hearts so that we can be part of what he's doing in this season. He wants you and me to be part of what he's doing in this season. And he says the key, we need to go back to a fear of the Lord. That holy, reverential fear of the Lord. When God catches you out, we don't defend ourselves. We stop defending ourselves. When God catches you out, we stop defending ourselves. We are broken. We are broken. We are broken. We are broken. We are ready to respond. And I want us to pray. I know that we have another five, ten minutes left. I want us to pray for the fear of the Lord. God, let the fear of the Lord just visit us. As a community. Let the, we, we invite, we welcome the spirit of the fear of the Lord. We welcome him. We allow him to just move and deposit in our hearts a holy fear, a holy reverence for God. Lord, we allow you to circumcise our hearts this morning. We don't want to miss out on what you're doing. We don't want to have labored so much. We don't want to have labored so much and to miss out on what you're doing. God, we don't want to miss out on what you're doing. Let there be a holy fear of you. Give us hearts that are responsive to you. Give us hearts that bow, that bow, that bow, that bow, that bow to your presence, that yield to you, that are ready to yield to you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Just lift up your voice and talk to him. Talk to him about your heart. 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 Hallelujah. Father, I talk to you about my heart, oh God. Lord, give me a heart that is willing to yield, oh God. Give me a heart that is yielded to you. Not a heart that is hard, oh God. Not a heart that is resistant. Not a heart that is full of bitterness and anger. But give me a heart that, Lord, yearns for you, that longs for you, that desires you, oh God. That is in awe of you, is in reverence of you, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. Give me that kind of heart, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Father, as a congregation, as a community, we invite the spirit of the fear of the Lord to move through this place in the name of Jesus. We invite the spirit of the fear of the Lord to, to hover over every heart in the name of Jesus. We invite the spirit of the fear of the Lord to hover over every life to fill us in the name of Jesus. Oh, we just humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We invite the spirit of the reverential fear of the Lord into this house. We invite the spirit of the reverential fear of the Lord into our hearts, into our lives in the name of Jesus. Lord, release to us even today the holy fear of you. Release to us even today the awe of you. That we would stand in awe of your majesty. That we would stand in awe of your holiness. That we would stand in awe of your greatness. That we would not just be flippant with our words and with the things that we say. But Lord, there would be a true genuine fear of you birthed in our hearts even today in the name of Jesus. Lord, remove every heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Lord, remove every heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Lord, give us a heart that is malleable. Give us a heart that you can change, oh God. Give us a heart that you can mold and make, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, give us a heart that is willing to yield, willing to yield to the Spirit of God and to the movings of the Spirit in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask for that kind of heart, Lord God, even this afternoon, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Zebarega, 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 Zebarai, Rebaba, Shen, 
Lord, I ask, deal with every form of bitterness in our hearts. Deal with every form of anger and resentment in our hearts, O oh God. Lord, I know myself and others, we like defending ourselves, O oh Lord. Father, Lord, bring us to a place where we not defend ourselves, but we we'll allow you to defend us, O oh God. We we'll allow you to fight for us, O oh God. We we'll allow you, Lord, go to war on our behalf, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, release the spirit of the fear of the Lord in our midst, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Release the spirit of the fear of the Lord in our midst, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Release the spirit of the fear of the Lord in our midst, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. We bow, we bow, we bow, we bow, we bow. We come under, we come under, we come under, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We submit ourselves to the spirit of the fear of the Lord, to be taught by him, to be trained by him, to be tutored by him, to be taught about the reverential fear of you, to be taught how to worship you in spirit and in truth, to be taught how to bring honor to our Father, to be taught how to bring sacrifices that are pleasing to you, O God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, we allow you in, we allow you in, we allow you in. We allow you in this afternoon, O oh Lord. We allow you into our hearts, O oh God. We allow you in. We allow you in. We allow you in. We allow you in. Forgive us for every hardness of heart. Forgive us for every rebelliousness, O oh God. Forgive us for every resistance to change, O oh Lord. And Lord, let the fear of you, let the fear of you, let the fear of you come into our hearts even today, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Forgive us for every form of casualness that we've had. Casual to the things of God. Casual to the word of God. Casual to the call to prayer. Casual to a call to fast, O oh God. Casual to a call to wait upon you. Lord, we ask you to forgive us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. O Zebarega Zepa Koria Mamando. Reba Bashente Rebebe Seke Zeberege Zeberai. Reba Baseka Keria Mama Zai. Raba Baseka Rega Boria Mama Ze. Lord, I say, circumcise my heart. Circumcise my heart circumcise my heart circumcise my heart circumcise my heart oh god in the name of jesus remove every heart of stone give me a heart of flesh remove every heart of stone give me a heart of flesh remove every heart of stone give me a heart of flesh oh god lord give us a heart of flesh Oh, Zepa Korea, Mama and Dolo Bobo Shant.